Hello everyone um, and welcome to our webinar on preparing for the COVID-19 uh, inquiries. I'm Christine O'Neill um, and I am a partner in our government regulation and competition uh, practice and I have um, a range of experience in public inquiries. I've appeared as a solicitor advocate effectively as counsel um, for clients in um, the Scottish child abuse inquiry and shortly in the hospitals inquiry and I'm also instructed as part of a solicitor team um, for a client involved in the UK infected blood inquiry. Um, I'm joined this morning by my colleague Kirsten Burke who's an associate in our team and who's very wide experience in public inquiries across um, the United Kingdom. She's been involved for example also in the UK blood inquiry and in the Grenfell uh, inquiry. Um, so if we move on to just explain what we're going to cover um, today, I'll say a little bit more in a moment um, about, a, a, about some questions we'd like to ask you before we get started. Um, Kirsten is going to cover um, the concept of a public inquiry and, and what that is. I'll say a little bit then about the um, COVID-19 inquiries themselves. Um, Kirsten will pick up on this idea of being a core participant, which um, is quite a, an important concept for those of you who think you might be involved in these inquiries. And then I'll finish off by talking a little bit about some practical things around preserving evidence for the purposes of inquiries and also the idea of legal professional privilege. But I'll hand over now to Kirsten to um, give us a bit of a uh, discussion on what exactly is a public inquiry. Good morning. Um, I start by saying that the term public inquiry is not defined in legislation. However, Jason Beer QC, who writes on public inquiries has coined a commonly used definition, which I have paraphrased on slides. Essentially, the purpose of an inquiry is to establish what happened and why, who's responsible, and what can be done to avoid similar events recurring. An inquiry does not result in anyone being found liable in a civil sense. So, for example, an inquiry can't order that compensation is paid, and it doesn't find anyone guilty of a criminal offence. Separate criminal prosecutions or civil claims can arise out of the same event and can indeed run at the same time as an inquiry. There's also nothing to prevent criminal proceedings being raised based on the findings of an inquiry. And this is something which Lord Brodie highlighted last year when launching the Scottish Hospitals Inquiry. This certainly might ring alarm bells in relation to self-incrimination. Now, that's a big topic in itself, which we don't intend to cover today, but we'd be happy to pick that up at another time if that's something that your organisation might be concerned about. Inquiries can be set up by the UK government or the Scottish, Welsh or Northern Ireland ministers. And they may be set up jointly by different governments working together. Now, a chair is appointed by the minister or ministers responsible for setting up an inquiry and funding is provided by government or governments. But otherwise, an inquiry is independent from government. Inquiries, unlike litigation, are inquisitorial, not adversarial. And this just means that the inquiry will take an investigative approach to its work. The chair of the inquiry will appoint counsel and solicitors to the inquiry who will carry out that investigation with him or her. Inquiries may be statutory or non-statutory. But today we are going to look at statutory inquiries, which are set up under the Inquiries Act 2005. Under this Act, the Chair has the power to force individuals and organisations to provide information to the inquiry, as Christine's mentioned, and to require witnesses to give oral evidence under oath at a hearing. A key feature of a statutory inquiry is there's also a presumption contained within the Act that the hearings will be held in public and this public dimension is seen as a really important part of the inquiry process. In fact, in recent years, a number of inquiries have streamed their hearings live on YouTube to try to increase public access. Just moving on to the next slide. On this slide, you can see a number of public inquiries that have taken place into a range of subject matters. And indeed, Brodies have been involved 
involved in a few of these. An inquiry can be set up to investigate a disaster which caused the loss of life, such as inquiry into the Piper Alpha disaster or the inquiry into the train collision at Ladbrook Grove. The ICL inquiry investigated the explosion of a Stockline plastics factory in Mary Hill, and it's still an inquiry to date, which has been set up jointly between the UK and Scottish governments. Inquiries may also investigate actions or indeed the inactions of public authorities over a prolonged period of time, such as the inquiry investigating undercover policing in England, which was set up by the UK government, or the Penrose inquiry, which was set up by the Scottish government to investigate the contaminated blood scandal in Scotland. And that was before the UK wide infected blood inquiry was established. Inquiries may also investigate things which happened over many years. For example, the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry is investigating the abuse of children in care from as far back as the 1930s, right up until 2014, when the inquiry was announced. And finally, inquiries may vary greatly in their duration. Um, the Undercover Police Inquiry and the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry are ongoing, having both been set up in 2015. However, the ICL inquiry reported in approximately a year after it was, it was set up. Christine, can you tell us a bit about what we know about the COVID inquiries so far? Okay, so if we um, look at, at these um, statements or parts of statements that were made by the Prime Minister and the First Minister, respectively, um, earlier in the year, the UK government announced its intention to set up a UK-wide inquiry in May of this year and um, the sentiment expressed by the Prime Minister then was effectively that the response to COVID had been a UK-wide response and in essence if there was to be an inquiry and indeed if there were to be lessons learned um, that should be done at a UK level. It was acknowledged in the announcement that was made in Parliament that there would be particular um, interests for the devolved administrations and that the devolved administrations would be consulted on what would, would be covered by the UK um, wide inquiry. But an important aspect of this and, and undoubtedly an important aspect, I think, um, it, it, as part of the decision making for the Scottish inquiry was what the Prime Minister said about timing. So um, part of the statement that was made to Parliament in May of last year um, referred specifically to um, the point that preparing for and participating in an inquiry can itself be an onerous um, exercise. And the Prime Minister referred to the fact that um, being involved in the inquiry would place a further burden on the NHS, would place a further burden one government and would place a further burden on others who might want to be involved in the inquiry. And that was um, part of the justification given by the Prime Minister for announcing that while an inquiry would be set up, it would not um, be set up or start to operate before the spring of 2022. Um, that timing, um, I think, did not find a particular favour with the Scottish government, I should say that th this UK wide approach is something that to date has been endorsed by um, the First Minister of Wales um, and the Northern Ireland administration has, has said relatively little about um, whether there might be a separate inquiry for um, Northern Ireland. But in Scotland, the, um, the Scottish government had made a commitment before um, the last election and as part of its manifesto um, commitments for the most recent election that it would set up a public inquiry into um, the handling of the COVID pandemic in Scotland. Um, it was something that they looked to um, develop uh, by the hundredth day of their administration following um, the election and indeed made their announcement um, just I think on the 99th rather than hundredth day. Um, and the First Minister's um, announcement was that the inquiry would look at matters relating to the handling of the pandemic that were within devolved competence. Now, that's not just decisions made by the Scottish Government, it's also decisions 
need by others in Scotland, but in areas um, that fall within devolved competence, and we'll, we'll come in a moment to look a bit more closely at that. Um, Scottish Government also said that it was going to continue to liaise closely with the UK Government and the other devolved governments on um, the UK-wide inquiry, um, but that wasn't a reason to delay establishing um, the Scottish inquiry. The First Minister acknowledged the potential for duplication, and of course that's one of the issues that has arisen in relation to the UK blood inquiry, which to some extent is examining matters already examined um, during the, the Penrose inquiry, so there will be a question in due course about how evidence that may have been given to perhaps the Scottish inquiry um, at an earlier stage is to be treated by um, the UK inquiry, but, but we're too early in the process to know how the, the two inquiries are liable to um, treat uh, the work of one another. Um, so if we move on, this is what we know thus far um, about these two inquiries is that we have from the UK government a start date of spring um, 2022 and um, the Scottish inquiry by the end of this year. What I should emphasise is that a start date does not mean the date of the first, for example, public hearings. Um, start date normally means the date on which the chair can get um, on with their work uh, together with the inquiry team in terms of gathering evidence and starting to look at what um, they want to do. Uh, in the inquiry, but there can be a long um, gap between the inquiry starting its work and the beginning of formal hearings. Both inquiries are to be statutory, so they're to be under the 2005 Act that Kirsten has already mentioned. Um, we know, uh, because the Scottish Government has said so in its um, announcement, that a judge is to be appointed as chair of the Scottish inquiry. There's no requirement. Um, under the uh, 2005 Act that the chair is a judge. It's very common that a judge is appointed, um, but we don't yet know um, the approach that the UK government intends to take to that question. Um, it's also relatively common these days for the TORS terms of reference for an inquiry to be the subject of some public consultation. Again, it's not clear how the UK government intends to deal with that, but we do know um, that the Scottish government um, is, is now consulting on um, its aims and principles for the inquiry that will feed into the terms of reference that are ultimately set by ministers for um, the chair. And, and I'll come to look at that in a little bit more detail. In terms of the remit for each inquiry, um, again, the UK inquiry, we, we don't know yet uh, what will be its terms of reference although there has been a recognition by the UK government that one of the issues the inquiry will want to look at particularly is the impact of COVID on BAME communities. Um, and that, that's really the only specific that we have around the UK inquiry at this time. In terms of the Scottish inquiry, um, there has been a reference to the four harms of COVID-19. And if we just move on to the next slide, um, this forms part of a, a statement or paper that has been issued by the Scottish Government for consultation on the aims and principles of the inquiry. And it's intended um, that the Scottish inquiry will scrutinise actions taken, and, and as I say, not just actions taken by the government, but actions taken uh, in response to the pandemic with a particular focus on four harms. Those are the direct health impacts of COVID-19 um, and a, an express reference to cases and deaths in care homes, other health impacts, societal impacts, including education and economic impacts. Um, another aim uh, is to scrutinise the decisions that were taken and to learn lessons for future pandemics. I've already mentioned um, the aim of avoiding duplication um, with the UK-wide inquiry. And the aims and principles document refers specifically to a person-centered um, human rights-based approach to ensure that people and organizations taking part can meaningfully participate, be treated fairly, and be empowered to take part in the inquiry. That, um, that phraseology, that sentiment, is something, again, that can be seen in a number of uh, recent Scottish inquiries, 
um, and it's an emphasis that has been placed in those inquiries by the chair in seeking to make it plain that an inquiry is not intended to be like a courtroom and is not intended to be experienced um, like a court process. Um, Lady Smith in the Child Abuse Inquiry has been extremely clear about that in the way in which um, evidence has been taken uh, from survivors of abuse and Lord Brodie in his um, video that you can watch on YouTube introducing the hospital's inquiry also talks about a person-centred approach and the first hearings in the um, hospital's inquiry um, which begin a week on Monday are focused on on the experience of um, those who were treated in and the families of those who were treated in or, or not treated in the hospitals that are the subject of um, those inquiries. And he's referred specifically to that person-centred uh, approach. So that's the aims and principles that have been published by the Scottish Government. If we move on to um, the next slide, it's just a reminder of something that you may or may not know already which is that that is open for consultation until the 30th of September um, this year. We know a number of clients have already received direct correspondence from the Scottish Government inviting them to respond to the consultation and to um, comment on the aims and principles and, and to, to um, provide their views on, on the terms of reference. It's open to anyone to respond uh, to that. And if you have um, a particular interest in the inquiry, if you have particular issues um, that you, you would want to see covered by the inquiry, then this is your opportunity. The, the, the aims and principles and the terms of reference may not become very granular, so detailed issues may not feed their way through into the final terms of reference, but uh, any response that you make, uh, I suspect, will feed its way through in one shape or another. Uh, ultimately to the chair of the inquiry. So um, if you do have views, then it's worth uh, making those known. Um, so that's where we are in terms of the Scottish inquiry. Um, some of you have already talked about, in, in response to the poll, um, the likelihood that your organisation might want to participate in the inquiry. And you might want to think about doing that as a core participant. Um, and uh, Kirsten is now going to just say a little bit about what it means to be a core participant and why you might want to be in that um, in that frame. Yes, core participants, they have a special status in the inquiry and they can normally make opening and closing submissions at the hearings of the inquiry, have access to documents and witness statements before they're made public, apply to question witnesses at an inquiry hearing, and obtain a copy of the inquiry's report before it's made public. Now, generally, the chair of the inquiry has discretion as to whether or not a core participant can exercise these rights. In particular, it is rare for the chair to grant permission for core participants to directly question witnesses. Recent inquiries have followed a process that involves core participants being invited to submit suggested lines of questioning for witnesses with questions being asked by counsel to the inquiry. If a core participant thinks a line of questioning hasn't been fully explored by counsel to the inquiry, it can then make an application for questioning. But su such applications are usually only granted in exceptional circumstances. Now, I can imagine that some of you will be thinking about whether or not your organisation should apply to become core participants in one or both of the COVID inquiries. And we have been asked by clients whether there are disadvantages to becoming a core participant. There will be a cost involved, but other than that, we've really struggled to think of any, mainly because although a core participant has the option to do things like make opening and closing submissions and review documents before they're made public, it can't be forced to do so. A core participant can choose just to be involved in the parts of the inquiry that are relevant to it, and this can help manage costs. Indeed, the inquiry itself might split itself up into various phases and ask for people who are core participants in the overall inquiry to apply to be involved in each individual phase. It's worth bearing in mind that organisations who are not core participants can still be called as witnesses or be required to provide some 
substantial documentation to an inquiry. Um, depending on your organisation's circumstances, you may take the view that if you're going to have to provide evidence anyway, you would like to have the advantages of being a corporate participant. In particular, it might be helpful to be able to view the other evidence the inquiry is gathering and to make submissions about your organisation's position at the inquiry's hearings. Just moving on to the next slide. Now, how do you become a core participant? A party must apply to become one and they can't be forced to do so by the inquiry. In the same way that the inquiry, that the government has invited um, people to respond to the consultation process, an inquiry might invite an organisation to become a core participant. However, this invitation doesn't have to be accepted. Equally, not every person or organisation who applies will be granted core participant status. In deciding who should be a core participant, the chair will take into account whether the applicant played a direct and significant role or has a significant interest in an important aspect of the matter to which the inquiry relates, or whether the individual or organisation may be subject to criticism during the inquiry proceedings or in any report that's published by the inquiry. However, not every individual or organisation who meets these criteria will automatically be granted core participant status. The chair must also consider the desirability of including that person as a core participant. This provides the chair with a wide discretion and an inquiry may publish its own guidance in relation to how this discretion will be used. This is likely to be the case where there have been a large number of people directly affected by the event or events and who may wish to be involved in the inquiry. For instance, in the infected blood inquiry, the chair, Sir Brian Langstaff, noted that anyone who was affected with hepatitis C or HIV by contaminated blood products, or who was affected by being close to someone that was infected, could satisfy the relevant criteria to become a core participant. However, he also acknowledged that this would raise challenges of scale, which few other inquiries had faced. To deal with this, he published guidance providing that those who'd been infected or affected were not automatically entitled to be core participants, and he set out additional criteria for applicants to meet. I think we can all imagine that the COVID inquiries will raise even greater challenges of scale. Everyone in the UK is likely to have been impacted to some extent by the handling of the pandemic, with those in Scotland having been affected by decisions of both the UK and the Scottish governments. It seems really likely that guidance issued by the chairs of the inquiries will play a significant role in order to manage the number of core participants in the inquiries. The inquiries may encourage commercial organisations and charities to become involved through a trade or umbrella body, which then applies for core participant in the inquiries rather than having a number of individual um, players within the same sector be designated as core participants. Just moving on to the next slide. Even if you're not a core participant, you may be a witness in the inquiry. And unlike in civil litigation, where a party can choose its own witnesses, the chair decides who gives evidence in an inquiry. Witness evidence is initially given by way of witness statement submitted to the inquiry. And we have experienced two different ways of this being done. One way is for the inquiry to take control of the process and take the witness statements from individuals. And the other is for the party's lawyer to take the statement and return it to the inquiry. In either case, the inquiry will determine who will be called to provide oral evidence at a public hearing. So you can see that there's a, a real difference between litigation where the parties drive the proceedings and inquiries where it's really driven by the inquiry itself. When you're preparing for the inquiry, your organisation should think about who was involved in key decisions and actions taken during the pandemic. If the inquiry asks for information, you want to know who's best place to provide it. And you also want to have a think about 
what will happen if a colleague who's likely to be a witness leaves? They can still be called to give evidence to the inquiry. Therefore, it's really worth making sure you have up-to-date contact details and if possible, that they're on good terms with the organisation and are willing to help. Christine, could you um, touch upon document preservation and the sort of physical side of evidence? Yeah, thanks, um, Kirsten. And um, as Kirsten has said, the, the inquiry has the power to force and, and compel production of documents. And again, in our experience, inquiries can um, issue really quite wide requests for documents. Um, so a very wide range of material might be covered by um, the notices issued by an inquiry. Um, if you think that you are going to be affected by this inquiry, then it is, in our view, very much worthwhile thinking now about um, your documents and about the information that you hold. Um, so first of all, that you can keep hold of that. Um, now, now you may you may be tempted to um, to get rid of documents. Um, you may be tempted to try and tidy up documents um, at this stage. I think that needs some quite careful thought. Um, I'm conscious, for example, that when the child abuse inquiry was um, established, the Scottish government put a moratorium on the um, destruction of documents that might fall within the scope of the inquiries. Um, work. So even historic documents that might otherwise be um, destroyed as part of an ordinary document retention policy, um, th those were held because they might form part of the inquiry's work. And, and you may want to look at your document retention policies and have a think about whether there is a risk that relevant information for this inquiry might be lost if those policies were applied in a standard way. So you might you might want to think about um, putting some sort of document hold, to use that expression, on your organisation, not least because um, of what we've described as perception or the potential for criticism if you end up in the inquiry and are asked about documents and nothing has been done to preserve relevant material or worse steps have been taken um, to delete relevant material. We know of at least one client who's already thinking about this and about bringing together in a central repository the material they think might be relevant to the inquiry. That feels to us like a very sensible thing um, to do. The one thing that we would also say is think about how you're doing that and, and recording how you do it at the time. Um, our, our main don't is to don't destroy relevant documents or um, in doing so leave your organisation vulnerable to speculation or criticism about why that might have been um, done. And then finally, if we move on to um, the last slide, it's just a point about legal advice and legal professional privilege. An important aspect of the inquiry's regime is that an inquiry, although it has very wide powers to force the production of information, what it can't do is force the production of material that is subject to legal professional privilege. Now, for some, some pieces of material, that's really obvious because it's legal advice and legal advice tends to be covered um, by privilege in most cases. But there's also material that doesn't necessarily come directly from your lawyers that might be covered by litigation privilege. So material that is prepared um, in response to the threat of or in relation to actual litigation and there may be material that you hold that would be covered by a document request from the um, inquiry that might enjoy the benefit of litigation privilege so those are things that will have to be considered as and when you do receive requests for documents and um, we've also seen in a number of inquiries that the inquiries themselves um, are inviting parties not to insist on their rights to protect privileged material and to, to waive privilege um, by sharing their legal advice and privileged material with um, the inquiry. Um, although there can be quite a lot of pressure to do that, um, it's clear from the regime that the inquiry is not entitled to draw any adverse inference from a refusal to waive privilege. And certainly, um, my view is that waiver of privilege is something that needs to be thought about extremely carefully and um, done in very exceptional uh, circumstances. Every organisation will have their own view um, about that, but privilege is certainly something 
um, that needs to be thought about um, with some care. Now, that's really all we wanted to say in terms of introducing to you the, um, the two inquiries that, that are going to be um, forthcoming. Um, we hope that that was useful. We do have um, a couple of questions um, from, from you from this morning, and please do add uh, to those. Um, the first, uh, which um, has come in, is, is around the consultation exercise that I talked about um, by the Scottish Government on the proposed terms of reference for the Scottish Inquiry. And the question is, if you, if you do respond to that, um, will your response be subject to public scrutiny? So you may or may not have seen me um, busily typing away while Kirsten was speaking. Um, I was just checking exactly what the Scottish Government had said about that um, in its announcement because I knew there was a privacy notice um, on, online. What they've said is that in relation to personal data, uh, their intention is not to share any of that information with anyone else. Um, and I suspect that that's intended specifically with, um, with those who've been bereaved or who have um, suffered themselves from COVID in mind. So the, the, there is certainly no expectation that individuals who provide information will see their information shared more widely. Um, I would be surprised if the consultation responses from organisations were published in full. Um, but two things to think about, um, it's entirely possible that the Scottish Government will um, publish some sort of response to the consultation that perhaps at least lists those organisations that have responded and summarises um, the range of responses that it has received. Um, and the other thing uh, just to mention is that in any event, if you respond to the Scottish Government, then at least in principle, if the government has um, that information, then it might be uh, subject to um, being disclosed in response to a freedom of information request. All of that being said, um, it seems to me that that's a, that's a point that maybe goes to how you frame your response and the tone of the language that you use. Um, rather than not responding at all, because certainly if there are things that you are keen to see the inquiry um, look at, then I, I would suggest that you, you know, you do, um, you do respond in whatever way you can, you can find an appropriate way of, of doing, um, because this is, this is effectively your, your chance. And Kirsten, this is a question for you, <laughs> and it's, and it's perhaps a question that we don't want to answer, but um, do, do those who are involved in the inquiry, whether as witnesses or the recipients of documents or, or as core participants, do they actually need to have lawyers? No, they don't. Um, there is a process within the rules of the inquiry where you select your lawyer and they get recognised as your recognised legal rep representative um, the rules the powers that we discussed um, during our presentation about things that the a core participant can do um, the rules sort of suggest that they would be done by the recognised legal representative on the core participant's behalf however if the core participant doesn't have a lawyer um, they can exercise um, that process themselves um, Christine Wright, it might be we, we might be have a sort of conflict of interest in answering this question. Um, it's obviously enti entirely up to you, but you might want to think about how you would manage the response. Inquiries are quite unique beasts, and um, you might just want to give some consideration as to whether you do want some help managing that and ensuring that you have a sort of effective relationship with the inquiry and um, are responding to exactly what they want from you. Um, there are consequences for failing to um, comply with requests for the, from the inquiry and these include, include criminal proceedings. Um, but no, overall you, you can engage directly with the inquiry if that's what feels right for your organisation. And we should also say that in relation to a number of inquiries where Participants perhaps have been individuals who don't have um, necessarily the resources to engage 
um, lawyers on their own account, um, provision is made for payment of um, of legal uh, costs to 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 particular um, to particular levels. So there is some um, assistance available there. Well, I think, in fact, we have exhausted the questions that we have been asked. Um, we hope that this has been a useful introductory session. Um, Kirsten spoke about um, core participant status, and I should mention that we published a blog um, this morning on exactly that topic that goes into a bit more detail around core participant status than we, we've been able to mention um, on the webinar um, today. And we'll email out a link to all of you who've participated um, this morning uh, to that blog after the event and hopefully also send you this recording in due course if that would be useful. And um, we'll follow up when we know more about both the Scottish Inquiry and um, the UK inquiry, but obviously if you have any queries in the meantime, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with either one of us. Uh, but for the meantime, thank you very much for coming along today and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.